Well, I, I enjoy saying this, and I'm going to say it to you again. Merry Christmas. It's good to hear that, isn't it? It's good to say that. It's, it's fun. We only get a few days a year that we really get to say that, and so I'm going to say it today one more time to you. Merry Christmas. So Christmas with my family this last week was, was good. It was relaxing. I grilled outside on Christmas Day. How fun was that? Yes. Uh, spent some much needed time with family, caught up on some movies. How many of you got caught up on your annual Christmas movies, watching any of those? I'm curious, who, who here, It's a Wonderful Life is like the movie that you got to watch every year? Yeah, all right. How many of you would say, I've never seen the movie in my life? Okay, all right, there's some. I've seen, I've seen parts of it, so don't shame the people who just raise their hand. You need to listen to Pastor Austin's message from last week. Um, We are in this series called It's a Wonderful Life, and uh, we've been in it since the beginning of December. We started off talking about fear, busyness, anxiety and worry, guilt and shame. Today we're going to continue the series of loneliness and depression, and we realize that it's maybe, you know, the, the Christmas season, it doesn't seem like a Christmas type of sermon series, but we also realize this, this is a lot of what people are dealing with, especially this time of year, and so that's why we wanted to tackle some of these topics um, for that. So today, loneliness and depression. R- by show of hands, how many of you have ever uh, seen or watched the World's Strongest Man competition? You ever seen that before? All right, there's more people now than last service. Um, it's competitors from all over the world who have names that, that we can't really pronounce, and, and they get together and they're competing to see literally who's the strongest. They're lifting hundreds of pounds um, and, and they are doing all of this just to say, I'm the world's strongest man. It's been going on from like the, the 70s or 60s possibly. Um, and I think I enjoy watching it because I like to live vicariously through them. <laughs> but they're doing things like this picture that you'll see up on the screen. They're lifting just massive amounts of weights. Um, and these guys are just powerful, powerful competitors. And one of the main events at this competition is called the Atlas Stones. Some of you have heard that before. The Atlas Stones are regarded as the signature event in this contest. So as the final event of the whole competition, this event often determines the winner. And this is what it looks like. Uh, so basically what they're doing, they're picking up five spherical stones. They're carrying them anywhere from 15 to 30 feet. And then they have to lift them onto those platforms. And as you can see, um, you know, they, they stagger in height. Um, it doesn't look like it's very high, but anywhere from 200 to three or 400 pounds that these guys are lifting and five of them. And typically this determines the winner, this competition. Um, in 1999, the heaviest Atlas stone was lifted, weighing in at 414 pounds. Not only did they lift it, but they had to carry it that way first. And um, this is just an amazing feat that these guys do. And so how many of you look at this picture? uh, How many of you would say, man, this is what I want people to see me doing in my life? Just crushing it, right? (laughs) Just like I'm just doing an amazing job. All of my goals are are, are getting accomplished. I'm doing well in, in all facets of life. But how many of you would say, really on the inside, this is what it feels like, right? (laughs) This is what it's like, like, oh my goodness. Can anybody relate, right? Um, Honestly, life can feel like this, can it? It feels like this is too heavy for me. I don't know if I can do this. Um, We can become crushed. The weight of the world, circumstances, the worries... So much more, it can crush us, and crush us to the point where we feel lonely, we feel depressed, we become all of that, Um, and a lot of people are living with the heaviness of the soul, and this is what your soul maybe feels like today, or have you felt this in the past, where this is what it feels like on the inside, like, I don't know if I can make it, I don't know if I can carry this any longer. Uh, For a lot of people, it's hard to understand, maybe to pinpoint it, where this is coming from, or the why behind it. We're smiling on the outside, but things feel heavy on the inside. Um, at the close of my message today, let's take some time to, to pray. Um, I encourage you to come down to the, to the front here to the altar, um, not just for what we're talking about, but just for anything. Uh, I want us to pray. So turn in your Bibles with me to Psalm chapter 42. I challenge you in 2020 to make it a goal to bring your Bible to church every Sunday. 
I know some of you have it electronically, and that works too, but if you can bring your Bible, um, it just, it's a great habit to be in. So loneliness. In a study that came out in 2018 by the University of California, San Diego, nearly three-fourths of Americans experience moderate to high levels of loneliness. Loneliness rates. So here, here's what's interesting to me. Loneliness rates are especially high for people in their late 20s, in their mid-50s, and in their late 80s. In 2016, there was a census taken in the UK, and it said that loneliness is the number one fear of millennials. Of young people today, loneliness is the number one fear, ranking ahead of losing a home or a job. There's an article also that came out in January of this year that, that um, gathered some data, and it says that loneliness and social isolation can be also damaging to your health, your physical health. It's as damaging as smoking up to 15 cigarettes a day. And especially the problem exists more acute with seniors, especially seniors around holidays, around times just like today. Depression affects all people from all walks of life, no matter what their background is, no matter what their age is as well. It's estimated that just over 16 million people in the United States will, will have had at least one major depressive episode in, in any given year. And there's a lot of factors that lead to depression. Maybe it's a mild form of depression. Maybe it's a major form. Maybe like in this season, you've heard of seasonal depression because there's not a lot of sunlight. Um, a lot of factors weigh into that. It could be your health. It could be just a chemical imbalance, circumstances, whatever it may be. And so uh, please listen to this. My goal is not to cover every aspect of loneliness and depression today because we all know this topic is so massive and so weighty that we don't have enough time, right? Uh, clearly, I'm not uh, a psychologist, a counselor, a therapist to be able to diagnose anything like that today. But, but I do want to bring up some, that, that this stuff happens. There is a loneliness that happens, isn't there? There is a depression that can take place, and, and things can seem heavy. It's, it's life, it's situations. Our souls feel heavy. And for some of us, it's short-lived. Maybe, maybe it's just a season. For some of us, this is a lifelong thing that we're battling. And so if it's on a low form of loneliness and depression, or if it's full-on war with you today, today let's recognize that they happen and what we can do about it, all right? So Psalm 42, verse 5, the psalmist writes, Why are you downcast, O my soul? Why so disturbed within me? Let's pause for a moment. By show of hands, how many of you admit that you talk to yourself? And keep them up there. Come on now. Now look around, all right? You feel better about yourself, okay? You're not alone in this. Maybe you give yourself a pep talk. Maybe it's a come to Jesus moment that you're giving yourself. Uh, maybe you're psyching yourself up and you're rehearsing what you're about to say to somebody. Whatever it may be, call it what it is. But the psalmist recognizes his soul isn't okay and he's talking to himself. Um, and the word soul is defined as your total self. It's your mind, it's your will, it's your, mo and your emotions. Your soul is truly who you are. And the psalmist says, my soul's not okay. My soul is downcast. The word downcast is defined as being low in spirit, dejected. So in other words, here's what he's saying, all right? This is my translation of it. Why does my mind, my will, my emotions, why do they seem dejected? Why is there no peace? Why am I low in spirit? My, why is my soul heavy? The message version of this translation says, or this verse says, why are you down in the dumps, dear soul? Why are you crying the blues? All right? So a lot of us can relate to this psalm. We know what it's like to have a heavy soul, to be low in spirit. We've lived it. We're living it now. But how did it happen? How did we get to the point of having a heavy soul? Well, one thing that I think is that we, we look at the past. We, stuff has happened in the past to give us this heavy soul. Lamentations 3, 19 and 20 says, I remember my affliction and my wandering, the bitterness and the gall. I well remember them, and my soul is downcast within me. The writer Jeremiah, he's miserable. He's downcast. He's depressed. He's dejected. He's lamenting over the devastation of Jerusalem. He's hurting. And I'm guessing that there's people here today who have a heavy soul because of hurts from the past. You made a huge mistake and you disappointed somebody that you love. 
you lost that job that you thought you'd have for a really long time. You come from a divorced home. You've been divorced. You've been hurt by someone. You've been abused. You feel like God lets you down. Painful memories from the past keep the wound open, don't they? And so there's this present heaviness of your soul right now because of something that's taken place in the past. Hear me. Jesus wants to heal. Jesus can heal. He's able to. My prayer t- for today, even last night as I was praying over this, this morning, is that, that there would be healing that would take place. And this is hard. This is something that it's not a physical outward um, thing that's hurting, but it's on the inside. And my prayer is that, that there would be healing that would take place today. How many of you would raise a hand and say, I have a heavy soul because of things in the past? Another reason for a heavy soul could be because of what's happening right now, in the present day. Look at the life of Job. In a matter of a few hours and and a few days, his world flipped upside down. The death of his servants, the livestock, his children, his entire body is covered with sores to the point where he's not recognizable by his friends. His wife tells him to curse God and die. Chapter 3, he cursed the day of his birth because of what was happening. His soul was downcast. And because of the current situation that you're in, you can relate to Job. You're you're discouraged. You're dejected. Things aren't going the way that you had hoped for in this present day. You're not satisfied. You thought at this stage of life you'd be in a different place. You thought maybe you'd be married by now. Maybe you would have kids by now. Your children, your grandchildren, they don't have faith in Jesus. Your finances are messed up. Uh, You didn't get the diagnosis that you wanted from your doctor. You fill in the blank. But because of what's happening today, there's a present heaviness of the soul. How many of you would raise a hand and say, today my soul is heavy because of what's taking place right now in my life. Right now. Another reason for a heavy soul is what lies ahead. The future. And I know that we we don't know what the future holds, but sometimes we can have an idea of what's coming. When we think about the future, it can be exciting, can't it? Like we have these plans and these goals for 2020 and we're hopeful for it. But for a lot of us, when we think about the future, it makes us anxious. It makes us overwhelmed. How are we going to make ends meet when the debt is growing and the bank account is shrinking? How, how long before the company lays you off? What if I get sick and die young? Anxiety and worry. Please go back. Two weeks ago, Pastor Luke shared a a great message on both of those, on anxiety and worry, and I encourage you to go listen to him. So Jesus, he knew what awaited him. Jesus was about to become a sin offering. He's about to be forsaken by his Father in heaven. And Jesus says that his soul is overwhelmed. In Mark chapter 14, verse 33 and 34, they're in the Garden of Gethsemane, and he takes Peter, James, and John along with him, and he begins to be deeply distressed, the Bible says, and troubled. And here's what Jesus says, my soul is overwhelmed with sorrow to the point of death. Jesus is deeply distressed, his soul. Like, when we say the word soul, it's like, that gets to the core of who you are, doesn't it? And he says, my soul is overwhelmed because of what's about to take place. How many of you would say, by a show of hands, the future? Because of that, there's a heaviness in my soul because I know what may take place or because of what, what I'm worried about. A couple of years ago, uh, my hip started to bother me. So I noticed it as I was walking. So you know the, the you know, when you, you place your hand on this front hip bone right here, you can just kind of feel it. Uh, whenever I would walk, um, like there's a popping taking place. And it wasn't painful, it was just super annoying. You know, one of those things is like, ah, what is going on here? And I let it go on for for a good year before I just got annoyed with it. And I did just to make sure that I wasn't going crazy and that my wife could verify that there was something happening. I had her, like, as I'm walking, put her hand there. And she's like, there's like a a muscle that was popping there. And so I finally did something about it. I went to my doctor. My doctor refers me to a physical therapist. And so I'm beginning this regimen of going once a week to my, my physical therapist. At the beginning, she had asked, have you had, you know, previous injury? 
And I'm like, nope, there's nothing, you know. Um, I'm a pretty healthy guy. There's nothing really taking place. Um, and so we continue this process, and nothing's really progressing. Like, she's doing therapy, but I'm not really getting better. And so finally she re-asked me again, have you ever had an injury? And then all of a sudden it dawned on me. A couple years prior, I was playing church softball, and that's when I realized I wasn't as young as I used to be. <laughs> How could I have forgotten that night? And I don't know if any of the guys that were here that night maybe remember, but my leg felt like it was on fire. Like you, when you pull a muscle, anybody ever done that before? You pull a muscle and it's like someone took a blowtorch to that spot and it hurt so bad. How could I have forgotten that night? I went, after the game, I drugged my leg into high V just to find the icy hot, you know? I was this close just to slapping it on there in the store. It hurt so bad. How could I have forgotten that night? And so finally, um, when I said that, she began to press in on, on my muscle and she's like, does that hurt? Nope. Does that hurt? Nope. Does that hurt? Yep. That, there it is. It's right there. And she, it was this deep, deep, uh, pulled, you know, sore muscle that she finally found. And when that happened, then my therapy began to take place. And no longer, you know, does my hip bother me anymore. But I began to think, I'm just going to have this forever. I'm just going to have to deal with it. I just have to live with it. And I want you to know today that you don't have to live with the heavy soul. You're not created to carry this weight. Why do we try? Why do we try? It's not something meant for us to carry in our own strength. So we can actually learn from the psalmist here. Yes, he's talking to himself, but he's proclaiming truth. Pastor Hawkins shared with me earlier this week that he says, what, what you say to yourself has a lot to do with how you, you navigate the situations that you face. You know, um, preaching truth to yourself is very important. And so let's look at what the psalmist says again in Psalm 42, verse 5. He says, why are you downcast, O my soul? Why so disturbed within me? And then he, he begins to preach truth to himself. He says this, put your hope in God. Put your hope in God, for I will yet praise him, my Savior and my God. So here's what he's saying. He's saying, soul, put your hope in God. Stop focusing on all the issues, on the problems that are taking place or that have happened or you think may happen. Put your hope in God. When we have hope in God, there's a confidence that's there, isn't there? When we have hope in God, there is a certainty rather than an uncertainty because we know of who he is. Hope is trusting in God. Hope is having faith in God. Hope is this confident expectation based on what he's done and what he's promised. When we have hope in God, it doesn't make your life a walk in the park any longer, right? Any one of you have walked any amount of time with the Lord, realize that it doesn't make it just all of a sudden, the, the problems go away. The storms don't go away. But here's what hope does. It gives you a bedrock for your soul that you can lean upon, that you can trust, that you can uh, lean into because of it. So when your soul is heavy, you need to preach truth to yourself. Now listen, if it, it's almost easier to tell a friend these truths than it is to tell yourself these truths. It's easy, if your friend was in this position and they had a heavy soul, you would be saying these same things to them. But in turn, we realize that we don't, we're not always around people all the time. We have to preach the truth to ourselves because the enemy is attacking us all the time. And so we need to learn to tell our soul some important steps. The first step is this, to remember God's faithfulness. You need to say, soul, remember God's faithfulness. Verse 6 uh, Psalm 42 says, my soul is downcast within me. Listen to what he says, therefore I will remember you. No matter where he was at, he was choosing to remember God. But isn't it tempting to look at the past and the hurts? Right? It's tempting just to relive those moments. It's, it's easier almost to keep that wound open rather than see God's faithfulness. For some reason, our, our, our brains can just automatically go to the worst and we relive those moments rather than remember how God is faithful to us. Jeremiah, we read in Lamentations 3, remember what he says in verse 19. He says, I remember my affliction, my wandering, the bitterness and the gall. I well remember them and my soul is downcast. He's remembering that. But watch what happens in verse 21. He says, yet this I call to mind and therefore I have hope. He's remembering God and the faithfulness of him. Because of the Lord's great love, we're not consumed. His compassions 
never fail. They're new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. I say to myself, he's preaching to himself too. I say to myself, the Lord is my portion. Therefore, I will wait for him. We need to remember God's faithfulness. The realization of God's faithfulness, his mercy, his compassion, that generated hope for Jeremiah. When he remembered that, it generated hope in his soul. Now his contemplation of trouble became a confession of faith. When, when we have faith, faith enables us to look at our circumstances through the reality of God. We don't see the circumstances through our own lens, but we begin to see it through the, the reality of God, and this gives us hope. And we can look back, listen, we can look back and find reason for a heavy soul, can't we? We can look back. There's lots of reasons to have a heavy soul based on the past. We can remember that, or we can look back and we, we can remember God's faithfulness. So let me jog your memory. Think about the time that you gave your life to Jesus. You found that first love. And, and the, the weight of that sin was taken away. The penalty of your sin was taken away because of Jesus. Remember that. Remember when you prayed for something that seemed impossible and God did a miracle through it. Remember how God provided for you financially, emotionally, mentally, physically. He brought healing. Remember when you read the Bible and there was a moment where that story or that Bible verse, it, it was like feeding your soul. That song that ministered to you. This is, guys, this is God's faithfulness here in just little things. Remember when you came to church that one time and, and um, it was like every song that was sung, every word that was preached, every prayer that was prayed was directly for you. Anyone had a moment like that? It was like no one else could have showed up to church, but you were there and that's what was needed. That's God's faithfulness. And, and when your soul feels heavy, you need to not look at the past, at the hurts. You need to look back at God's faithfulness through it. God has been faithful to you, and that's ministered to me. Because of your stories and God's faithfulness to you and how you've shared, that's ministered to me. So we need to be able to remember God's faithfulness. The second thing we need to tell our soul to do is to cry out to God. You need to tell your soul, cry out to God. You need to give this to Him. David cried out to God as he hid in a cave. In Psalm 142, verses 2, 5, and 6, here's what he says. I pour out my complaint before him. Before him, I tell my trouble. I cry to you, O Lord. I say, you're my portion in the land of the living. Listen to my cry, for I am in desperate need. Rescue me from those who pursue me, for they're too strong for me. David laid it all out before the Lord, didn't he? Some of us, we try to be too polished in our prayers with the Lord. Just tell him. Just tell him what's going on. Sometimes you can barely muster up just a few words because it's so heavy. But you know what? You're, you're laying it before the Lord. And I encourage you to do the same that David did. Cry out to him. Give it all to him. Here's the great thing about it. He can handle it. Right? He is God. He created everything. He can handle your complaints. And listen, when you do that, you're placing your hope in him. You're saying, I can't handle this any longer, God. I need you to help me. Please, bring a miracle. Do something. Take the heaviness of my soul right now. 1 Peter 5, 7. Write this down and you can go back later and read it. But it says, cast all your anxiety on him because he cares for you. God wants your anxiety. He wants your worry. He wants the heaviness. Why? Because he cares for you. He created you. But I want you to notice something. That word cast means you do it. He's not going to force you to do it. You have to cast it at his feet. You have to place that hope in him. You have to do it. So this summer when my doctor told me that I had melanoma and I needed to have it removed off my head, obviously I was extremely nervous. Um, I had witnessed this happen to my dad when I was about my kids' age. I didn't know, obviously, the seriousness of it at the time. Um, I was worried about what the future would hold for my wife and for my kids, my family. Uh, I wanted my kids and my wife and even myself, I wanted us to grow spiritually through this. Um, I wanted to trust God through it, but my soul was heavy. And some of you have gone through, through things where you know what it's like to have a heavy soul. Uh, there was a song that was written that came out, I think this year, last year, by Hillsong United called Highlands. And in that song, some of you have heard it, in that song, there's a line that really ministered to me. It, it says... I'll praise you on the mountain, and I'll praise you when the mountain's in my way. 
regardless, we praise God. And the psalmist is saying that right here. For I will yet praise him. Even though my soul is heavy, I will still praise him. God's character doesn't change, does it? He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. And, and so we need to get to the point where we need to cry out to God. Even in the heaviness of our soul, God is still God. He's the source of our hope. The other thing that we can do to our soul, we need to tell our soul is this. Trust in God's plan. We need to trust in God's plan. We read about Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane. He's with his disciples, and he's approaching the most difficult moments of his life. He's crying out to his Father in heaven. I want you to notice what he says in verse 36. He's just prayed that prayer. God, if it's, if it's uh, you know, I, I give this time, you know, my, my soul is overwhelmed. And here's what he says. Take this cup from me, yet not what I will, but what you will. Notice Jesus didn't tell his dad what to do. He didn't tell his heavenly father what to do. Jesus had this confidence. He had this hope. Jesus had a certainty in his father because of who he was and he trusted his father. Jesus was yielding to his father's will. So this summer when I was told I have skin cancer, I began to realize that aside from praying and crying out to God, there's nothing I could do. I know that seems so simple, but uh, I got to that point where I was like, there's nothing I can do. What, what am I going to do? I'm just going to pray and I'm going to trust God. He's got a plan. He's got a purpose through this. So out of the heaviness of my soul, I'm crying out to him. And now I had to trust him. I had to allow him to have his way and to bring good about it. And I encourage you to do the same. Listen, I realize it's easier said than done. Whatever we're facing, we need to trust God's plan, though. Hear this out. Pastor Jeff referred to this earlier, but he's working all things out. He's working all things out, and he has your good and his glory in mind. He has your good in mind, but he also has his glory in mind. Jesus knew that God had a big plan, and he yielded to him. Psalm 91 verse 2 says, I will say of the Lord, he's my refuge and my fortress, my God in whom I trust. Proverbs 3 5 says, trust in the Lord with all your hearts. Don't lean on your own understanding. So some simple thoughts, some simple things that we can tell our soul to do. They're so powerful. Hebrews 13, 8 says that Jesus Christ, he's the, what, same yesterday, today, finish it with me, forever. When your soul is heavy, you need to remind yourself of that. The God who was in the beginning is Emmanuel today, and he'll continue to be tomorrow. And in 2020, guess what? His track record is remarkable. You can trust him. Don't, don't try to carry this by yourself. Would you stand with me this morning? If your soul is heavy, it's downcast. You, you have a, a heavy soul today. It's, it's depressed, whatever it may be. Put your hope in God. Even now, would you quiet your spirit? Maybe close your eyes. Begin to tell God what's going on in your soul. Or for some of you, this is so difficult because you have to face reality. You have to become vulnerable but with, with God. But what better person to become vulnerable with than Him? So even in this moment, would you close your eyes? If you have a heavy soul today, would you lift your hands to Him? God, see you. See our souls. See what's going on. We put our hope in you today, Jesus. We put our faith in you. Jesus. Just a few moments as we sing, I invite you to come forward to pray. Find a place here at this altar. If you want specific prayer, come to the center and 
those who have other people come pray with you. But let's let's don't rush this moment. Let's don't let's don't just get out of here because we have other things to do. Let's just take these next few moments. Spend in God's presence. There are some heavy souls here today. And unless we lay it down at the feet of our master, we're going to continue to carry it with us. Please don't worry about what people will think. This is a safe place. This is a place of healing, of restoration. I believe that Jesus is going to heal people today. He's going to heal you of loneliness, of depression. I believe he's going to give you that strength that you've been looking for as you place your hope in him. God, today, we're so thankful for you. We're so thankful that you are Emmanuel. And that wherever we go, you are with us. And so today, we, we lay down the heaviness of our soul. We lay down what's happened in the past, what's happening now, or what's going to happen in the future. And we put our hope and our trust in you. We have a certainty in you. So Lord, I pray that you would set people there's so much value in being with people and as we place our hope not only in our eternal God um, there, there's so much value in being together isn't there 2020 is going to be a great year make it a goal of yours to be here as often as possible uh, we have some great small groups some life groups all that kind of stuff happening it's not just to do a bunch of stuff it's so that you can be in community with people when you have a heavy soul you have a, a community of people to pray with you. All right? Let's pray. Father, we thank you for this final Sunday of 2019. We look back at your faithfulness. We're so thankful. God, we look ahead to 2020. And we pray that it would be the greatest year of our lives spiritually, the greatest year of new hopes, life, spiritually that there would be growth that would take place so God we love you we thank you for your faithfulness in your mighty name we pray and everybody said amen, amen. be blessed